Well, good morning, and I want to join with Darrell in welcoming all of you here, and uh, thank you for allowing us to be where you are in your homes. If you're joining us for the first time, we certainly hope it won't be the last time, and we encourage you to uh, join with us in every opportunity that you have in all of our live stream services, and also as we try to emphasize each gathering, send us an email at office at lostriverchurch.org so that we can have correspondence with you. And one of the things that you'll receive is five days a week uh, devotional that will help recenter you and lift you up and get your mind focused on the Lord and His will for your life as we go through this difficult time. This pandemic uh, feels to me uh, like uh, a bit of an exile. The word, the word exile is, is simply a word that's used to describe uh, a people, either as a group or an individual person who has a home, but as a result of various events is driven from their home and is away somewhere, captive or simply unable for various reasons to return uh, home. And then the best stories in, in all of literature are about exiles who are driven away and then the things that they go through in their efforts to finally return home. You know, there's a real sense in which the whole Bible is a story of exile and return. We were once happy. We were once in the presence of our God. We were once united with Him, and heaven and earth were uh, overlapping realities that were meant to go together. But because of mankind's rebellion and breaking of trust with God, there was a severing of that relationship. And we were driven, as it were, from the garden, from the very presence of God. And as a consequence of that, there, there's been a great deal of wandering and suffering in the world and in our lives. And we all have a longing within us to return home, to return to the Father and to the Father's house, and to be with all of those from whom we have been separated through whatever reasons, and sin being one of the chief causes of separation, not only between us and God, but between us and one another. And so we have this aching, this longing, this nostalgia for home to return, to get back into the garden. And the Bible has many of these stories told in smaller detail than that one grand narrative. And one of those took place during the time of the Babylonian exile when the children of Israel uh, were taken away into Babylonian captivity. And there were a lot of people wondering when they were going to be able to come home. When were they going to be able to get back? And I don't know about you, but that's been one of the things that's always on my mind, is how long is this going to last? And specifically, wondering about the church. You know, when is it going to be okay for us to see one another face to face and to, to join together? And, and I long for that. I didn't, it's one of those things you just take for granted and you don't realize how much you miss being together and singing these praises with all of us joined together and being at this one table physically united as well as we are striving to do now spiritually. And so we're longing for that return from this feeling of, of exile, just like the captives, captives in, in Babylon were longing to return to Israel and to be able to assemble once more at the temple and worship God as they had in times gone by. And as I said a moment ago, there were a lot of prophets who were telling the people different things about when that would happen. Some said it would be very short. Some said it would be very long. But the prophet Jeremiah said something that I really think gets to the heart of when that return would be. For some, it would happen as early as 70 years. For others, it would take much longer. But there was something that was at the very center of what that return would mean and how that return could be possible. And Jeremiah puts it this way in Jeremiah 29 and verse 13. He says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I love that. You will seek me and find me when? When, when Lord, are we going to be able to find you? When, when is the seeking and this longing for return going to be consummated? When will we be together again? And, and the Lord's answer to that is when you seek me with all your heart. And so as we think about that, I began to imagine a variety of stories in the Bible that have this pattern of exile and return. 
And there are many instances of people who had to be uh, taken away for a while. And until those people discovered two things, number one, the truth about themselves, and number two, they sought the face of God, they could not return. I think that's a a continual pattern in so many of these stories, and it may be something that we can take hold of as we think about this ourselves. We need to seek after the Lord with all of our hearts, and that involves looking inward to see ourselves as we truly are, to find out if there are things within us that need to change, if we need to repent. And we need to be seeking after the face of God and realizing that All of the various things that we have been pursuing, that we've been trying to find value and meaning in and have become distracted by in our normal way of life are things that have gotten in the way of us seeking the one thing that is our life, the pursuit of God himself and with all our hearts seeking his face. One of these stories that I want to focus in on for a while this morning is the story of Jacob And as I tell you his story, and as we look at various parts of it in the record in Genesis, I hope that you'll look to see yourself in his story, because I think all of us will find various points of comparison that we can draw between ourselves and Jacob. And I also hope that as he finds his way home, that you'll be able to do so yourself. His story begins with his mother, Rebecca, who was barren, and she was longing for a child, and so Isaac, her husband, prayed for her, and she conceived. And as she was uh, pregnant with uh, this child, she realized that this was not an ordinary pregnancy. Something strange was going on. One of the remarkable things about each of our children that, uh, have, have, that came along uh, was, was when the baby would begin to move, and you could actually feel those movements uh, in, your, in my wife's belly. And it's just, it's, it's an amazing thing. But apparently for Rebecca, this was way over the top. And so she consulted from the Lord what the significance of this turmoil that she was experiencing in her pregnancy was all about. And it says in Genesis chapter 25, verse 23, that the Lord said to her, here's what's going on, Rebecca. Two nations are in your womb and two peoples will Uh, from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other and the older will serve the younger. So the Lord's telling Rebecca that there is a struggle that is actually going to continue on for generations and generations to come, but it's already begun within you because you've got twins and these two brothers, they're not, uh, they're not getting along too well. They're striving with one another. There's a great wrestling taking place. And and it seems that each of them is struggling for the ascendancy. Each of them wants to be the one who is on top, if you will. So that explains to her the situation that was going on. And so Jacob is one of the two children that are born. And we read about this beginning in verse 24 where it says, when the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. He's the older brother now. And after this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Now, now get this again, there's this tumultuous pregnancy, the time of delivery comes, Esau, the red hairy guy, uh, comes out first, but as he comes out, as his heel passes through the birth canal, the hand of his younger brother Jacob is firmly grasped around his ankle. This wrestling match that's that's begun within the womb is continuing as they pass out of the womb, and Jacob is trying to pull his older brother back. And that was a big thing, not that Jacob understood consciously what was going on, but this was indicative of how their life would be going forward. Because you see, the firstborn son, traditionally, in ancient cultures, and certainly in this one, 
had the, the law of primogenitor in which the firstborn son received the vast majority of the inheritance and would be the leader of the family and carry on the family line in the most significant ways. And so that was a big thing to come out first. Jacob resents this and he's holding on to his brother's heel, indicative again of this great struggle, which then explains why he was named, it says, Jacob. It says his hand was grasping his heel, so he was named Jacob. The word Jacob means literally one who grasps the heel. But it, in, it, it suggests something much more. And, and some translations will refer to him even as the supplanter. The supplanter. The one who strives to take the place of another. He wants to be the firstborn. He wants to inherit the blessing that it pertains to that status. And so he's trying to supplant or replace himself uh, it put himself in the place of his brother. It also is sometimes the same word used to describe someone who's tricky, someone who's a bit of a backstabber, someone who is grasping in their nature and will do whatever is necessary in order to try to get what they want, even if that means conniving and being sly and lying. And in fact, that actually comes out to be the kind of character that we see lived out in the life of the man, Jacob, the supplanter. He's so uh, desperate in this situation as they grow older that the two of the brothers, though they're very different, the older one, Esau, was sort of uh, this, this red hairy guy who was a man of the fields and he liked to hunt, be outdoors. And Jacob was a bit more of a man of the indoors and on one day, as you famously know the story probably, Jacob, I mean, Esau comes in from the field and he's just starving to death. He's hungry as all get out. And Jacob has got something, you know, cooking on the, on the stove. He's been simmering it all day and it smells so good. And it, you get the feeling that Jacob has sort of set this up because even though he wasn't maybe as big and powerful as, as his older brother, he was a little bit more shrewd and certainly more conniving. And so he sets this situation up where his brother comes in hungry and he says, hey, give me some of that stuff you've been cooking there. It smells great. And Jacob says, hey, sure, you can have it. And maybe, you know, fixes him the bowl and starts to slide it in front of him. And just as he's about to just dig in, he says, oh, hold on just a minute. You know, if I'm going to give you something, it's only fair that maybe you would give me something in return. In fact, here's what I want. If you'll, if you'll trade with me your birthright, if you'll, if you'll give to me the right that you have of being the firstborn brother in our family, then I'll give you this bowl that I've, of, of beans that I've been preparing. And Esau, a bit on the dim-witted side, or at least could only focus on the here and now, exchanges something of great value for something that he wants in the moment. And there's a good lesson in that. Don't trade what you want and what you value in the immediate for what you value most. Don't, don't trade what you want now for what you're going to want later. And so he does make this swap with Jacob. And so Jacob steals or connives or tricks his way into getting his brother's birthright. But there was something else that uh, Jacob uh, wanted from his older brother. And that was a special blessing that his father would confer upon each of his boys. He wanted the blessing because he knew that the blessing that his father Isaac would have in mind for um, Esau would be a greater blessing than what he had in mind for him as Jacob because Isaac had favorites. He favored Esau over Jacob. He loved him more and treated him better. And so when Isaac became old and was on his deathbed, he decided that it was time to confer this deathbed blessing upon his two sons. And hearing that this was going to happen, Jacob and his mother conspire together to steal Isaac, uh, uh, Esau's blessing. And so what he does, his father was old and, and it says blind. And so he, he covers himself in some kind of furry uh, uh, skins so that he'll be hairy like his brother. And he cooks him a meal and he comes into the tent and, and he's presenting himself before his father as if he were his older brother. And it says this, so that he went, verse 18 of Genesis 27, so he went into his father and said, my father, and he said, here I am, who are you, my son? I want you to notice that. Isaac, the father, asks Jacob, his son, who are you? 
He's wanting to make perfectly clear who it is that he's about to give this blessing to. So he asks him, who are you? It's a good question, isn't it? It's a good question for all of us to ask ourselves right now. Who am I? What's my real identity? And Isaac wants to know. So he says, who are you, my son? And Jacob says to his father, I am Esau. He lies. He's still grasping the heel. He's still trying to reverse the roles and supplant the position. I'm Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me, so now sit up and eat of my game that your soul may bless me. Here's a son who's perhaps been treated as a second-class citizen, and as a result, he has allowed envy to take root in his heart to the point that he's willing to lie and connive his way into receiving a blessing that doesn't even belong to him. To present himself in a false identity, to try to receive a blessing that actually belongs to someone else. And so he's desperate for affirmation, and he tries to receive this blessing under a false identity. And here's what happens. He gets the blessing, but he loses himself. If you try to get something by being someone that you're not, if you're so desperate to receive affirmation, if you're so desperate to receive whatever it is that you have decided to place your value on, that you're willing to hide who you really are in order to have it, you can receive that blessing, but you're going to lose yourself. Sort of reminds me of what Jesus said, what, what value is there if you gain the whole world but you lose your own soul, your own self, your very life. It's not a good trade. And that's exactly the trade that Jacob is making here. And so God can't bless what you pretend to be. If we're dishonest, if we're fundamentally um, pretending to be someone else, how is it that God can bless us in that falseness, in that pretension? It can't happen. And so he gets the blessing conferred on him, but it's not even really him who's receiving the blessing. And we see the outcome of this attempt. When his older brother Esau discovers what had happened and that his younger conniving brother's not only stolen his birthright, but now got his blessing too, he says to himself, I'm going to kill him any minute. And he didn't want to send his aged father, whom he loved, to the grave in mourning, and so he decides to wait until after his father dies before he takes the life of his younger brother. But again, Jacob finds out about this, and so he runs away. And this is the point in the story where we see Jacob going into exile. You might say in one sense he's already been there because he hasn't been his true self. He hasn't, he hasn't been who he really is. He's been trying so much to be somebody else that he lies about who he is. And so he's already, in some sense, in exile, but now physically, literally, he is sent into exile as a consequence of his conniving ways. Think about it. All his efforts to gain these things for himself has only resulted now in him losing all these things in nearly his own life. And so the Bible tells us that he flees from Esau's presence, and he goes into exile to a place called Haran, out to the west of the land he lived in. And there he served his uncle by the name of Laban for 20 years. And Laban, in this story, is an interesting character. He is, I believe, the writer setting before us Laban as the um, mirror image of Jacob. It's going to be an opportunity for Jacob to get a taste of his own medicine, a taste of his own stew, as it were. He's going to begin to see in someone else something that perhaps he had been unable to see in himself. You know, the, the reality is that it doesn't do usually a lot of good for us to just be told what we need to hear. We have to see it. And once we see it, and especially once we see it in someone else coming back at us in a way that we're hurt by the kind of things that we had been doing, that can provide the clarity that we need to see ourselves 
for what we really are. And I think that's part of the experience that, that Jacob is going through at this point in the story. You remember some of the things that happened. Laban, uh, Jacob falls in, in love with Laban's daughter, Rachel. And he wants to marry her, but Laban says, okay, you can, but first you've got to work for me for, for nothing for seven years. And so because he loved her, Isaac, uh, Jacob went to work for Laban for seven years. And at the end of that time, the wedding ceremony comes along and they go into the tent, they consummate the wedding. And the next morning when the sun comes up, he looks and behold, it's Leah, Rachel's sister, his, her unattractive and less desirable sister. And Jacob is enraged and he confronts his father-in-law and says, what is this that you've done to me? I worked for Rachel and you gave me Leah and now what's done can't be undone. And he says, well, I'll tell you what, you worked for me for another seven years and I'll give you the one that you want. And so he does so. But now he's on the receiving end of the very kind of thing that he has spent a lifetime doing himself to his brother and perhaps to other people. And maybe for the first time, he begins to feel the burn a little bit because you know, injustice and cheating, when we're the one doing it, it doesn't seem to bother us that bad. But when we're on the receiving end of it, we feel and we burn that, with that sense of injustice immediately. And if you're reflective at all, you begin to realize that as you feel this as a consequence of someone else's actions, maybe this is exactly what I've done to others in behaving that way myself. And so maybe the veil begins to come off the eyes of, of, of Jacob a little bit as he encounters this uncle Laban in his tricky ways. There are other things that happen through this 20-year period until finally the relationship between Jacob and Laban completely collapses. And it becomes unsafe. He's concerned again for his life and the life uh, of his family. And so Jacob has to flee from Laban and he secretly runs away at night just like he had run away from his older brother's rage uh, earlier, 20 years before. Finally, Laban catches up with him and looks like it's going to go badly, but they're able as a consequence of God's intervention to come to a peace treaty. And they set up a pillar of stones as a reminder in memorial. And each of them vows that they will not pass over this boundary into the other's territory. And so that's good news for Jacob in that no longer is he going to have to be afraid for his life from Laban and his family. But it also means now that Jacob is in no man's land. He can't go back to Haran and he can't go forward back to the promised land because that's where Esau lives. But having no choice, he decides to press on toward Esau and toward home. And he comes up with a strategy. Are you surprised? He comes up with a plan. He's going to send a lot of gifts before him and maybe he can placate Esau's wrath with enough gifts. And so he sends a lot ahead of him. And when he sends the messengers with all of these gifts ahead to Esau, perhaps several days ahead uh, journey, they meet with Esau and tell him that Jacob is on his way and here are all the many gifts that he's come to bless you with. And then the men, the messengers come back to Jacob bearing their report of Esau's reception and it's ominous. Here's what it says, beginning in verse six of chapter 32. When the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, we went to your brother Esau, and now he is coming to meet you. Okay. And 400 men are with him. 400 men. That, that's not a, a, a happy meeting. 400 men are coming to greet you. I, I bet they are. And Esau is rightly concerned about this. So he again, his, his, his active mind begins to come up with a plan and he decides, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to split my two wives and their children and all of my possessions in half and send one way over, one across the river into the land on, in one direction and the other over uh, in another direction. And that way, if Esau comes and he attacks, then the other can hear about it and they can flee and, and possibly spare their lives. And so the scripture tells us in uh, 
the, 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 the night, they cross over the river uh, Jabbok. And it says that uh, it was at nighttime, and they cross over the river, and the, t- the two groups are split each way. And, and once all the people and all the possessions and all the servants have crossed over, we're told that Jacob was left alone in verse 24, 32, 24. Jacob was left alone. You know, sometimes you got to be alone to sort things out. And it says that while he was there alone, and he's there by the bank of the river Jabbok, and in the darkness and in night and all alone, a man wrestled with him. He is attacked in the darkness. I don't know what must have come to his mind. Is, is, this, is this Esau? Who, who is it that is attacking me in the dark? But they wrestled till daybreak. Um, all night long, they're wrestling. And I want you to think about what a wrestling match looks like. If you're, if you're older like me, it's been a while since I've wrestled or fought with anybody. But if you've ever been up close to men in combat, men struggling against one another, it, it's an exhausting and it's a brutal experience. And there they are on the riverbank with the sand, the mud, the water, the reeds, all of that going on and back and forth, pinning one another this direction and that and all of the holds and the, and the, the choke holds and everything else that, that must have been a part of this is going on as they wrestle through the night and they do this until daybreak. And when the man saw, that is the man Jacob was wrestling with, that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Now, that's an interesting part of the story, and we're going to find out more about this man that Jacob is wrestling with a little bit later. Jacob is going to actually refer to him as, as God. Another passage later in the Bible refers to it as the angel. So there's some question as to the specific identity of this being, but clearly it is not an ordinary man. And he's wanting to make that clear by the fact that though they've been engaged in a struggle that's been back and forth, that it's been a struggle in which the other man was letting Jacob feel like he was his equal in this wrestling match. But the reality was they were poles apart. Because with the simple touch of his hand on his hip, his hip was taken out of socket. And so Jacob now is in great pain with his wrenched hip And yet he continues in this weakened condition to wrestle with the man as the day begins to break. And the man said to him, let me go, for it is daybreak. And this is an intriguing statement. Why why does daybreak have any significance that the man would now want to go? And one of the answers that commentators give to this is because this is, in some sense, a a pre-incarnate vision of, of, of God that he is appearing in the form of a man, but no man can see his face and live. And so under the cover of darkness, Jacob is able to have this encounter, but he must not see the face in the, in, in the, in the light of the sun or it will overwhelm Jacob. And so he says, let me go for the day is breaking. And then what happens next is critically important to our study. Jacob replies, I will not let you go unless you bless me. It seems at this point that Jacob is coming to a realization that this man that he's wrestling with is no ordinary man. The dislocation of his hip, something about this person's bearing in nature has caused Jacob to recognize that he is desperate for what only this being can give him. That he needs this blessing from God if there's any chance for him to be able to go forward in his life and to encounter his brother and the 400 men that are coming his way with him. And so he holds on in his agony and his pain. He refuses to let go. He's wrestled all night. He is exhausted, but he will not let go. And I won't let you go until you bless me. And so all his life, Jacob has been manipulating others, tricking people, pretending to be something other than he was in order to get what he wanted. But now he's found what he really needs, what's truly important, and he refuses to let him go. 
apart from his blessing. You know, we may feel like we are in exile, and then there's a real sense in which we are. If we seek his face with all our hearts, we can find him. And if we're willing to wrestle with God, that is to get real, to engage in a struggle, not just, oh, I believe and just go our way, but to, to, to try to come to terms with who is God and who is he and what separates him from everything else and what does it mean for me, a man, to have a relationship with God and to interact with him, to struggle to have our questions and our doubts and all the things that are a part of having a real and genuine relationship with God. If we're willing to wrestle all through the night and go through what may at times feel like the violent struggle to seek his face and to know him for who he is and to receive from him what we desperately need, if we're willing to do that, we just might be able to find what we need to make it home. And so it says that the man, that is the wrestling partner, says to Jacob, what is your name? Now, remember earlier in the study, this is the second time Jacob has asked this question. The first time was by his blind and aged father who was ready to confer a blessing on Esau. And so what did Jacob tell him? He said, I am Esau, your oldest son. But now, he says, I'm Jacob. Before, I'm whoever I need to be in order to get what I want. He he doesn't really maybe even know who he is. He doesn't have a strong sense of identity. And I think you really can't have a very strong sense of who you are and your identity until you have gone through the long night of wrestling with God. You'll just morph and change and shape and cover yourself in whatever skins you need to in order to get from other people what you want. It's no way to live. And sooner or later, all the grasping and striving, manipulation and lying and deception, being easy with switching our identity depending on the circumstances is going to catch up with us. And we're likely to lose everything. But Jacob has had an encounter that is changing him. And when asked for the second time by this person, who for some reason Jacob recognizes is not like my aged and blind father, I can trick him into thinking something that isn't true. But that's why coming face to face with God and wrestling with God is so important because now you are in an environment and in the grip of a person who cannot be deceived. Here is the person who sees into your heart and knows every last thing about you. And when you've really wrestled with him, you know that there will be no use in trying to deceive him about who you are. And so you may as well quit trying to deceive yourself. Oh, there's an unbelievable blessing in wrestling with the living God. And so he says, in answer to the question, who are you? Jacob, he says. And so the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. The name Jacob, heel grabber, supplanter, trickster, schemer, no longer is that going to be your identity. No longer will that be the name that you're known by and characterize, the conduct and, and character that you're characterized by, but rather in place of that, I'm giving you a new name. Because you've been real with me, I'm now conferring upon you a gift of a new name and you shall be called Israel, which means to wrestle with God or to strive with God or as some translations put it, to even be triumphant with God, to prevail with God. Not that he was stronger than God, the wrestling match proved that wasn't the case, but because he proved that he was desperate for God. Because he had wrestled through the long night and held on when there was nothing left in him to hold on with except the will to just keep holding on because I got nothing else. And you'll never know how much Jesus is worth until you don't have anything else and you hold on. And that's where Jacob is. And so he gets a new name, a name of honor instead of one of reproach. 
And so Jacob said, please tell me your name. And he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. He blessed the real Jacob, Israel. And so Jacob called that place Peniel, saying it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. And so the sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. If you come face to face with the living God, and you wrestle with him to discover who you really are and who he is, and you refuse to let him go until he blesses you, it'll hurt. And you'll be changed. And there's gonna be parts of you that used to be and things maybe that you even took pride in about yourself that have to be removed and are no longer functional. But what you gain versus what you lose is incomparable. What you gain is priceless. And so God gives him favor as he moves forward, even limping and weakened physically. He goes forward in faith. He goes forward not in conniving and in tricksterism. There's a word for you. But as a child of God, a new identity, he's moving forward in his identity of faith, believing in God instead of scheming and relying upon his wits. He goes forward and he meets his brother and God gives him favor in the sight of his older brother Esau. And he's able to go home. The exile returns and he comes home a changed man. And maybe in our exile, we're getting that opportunity to change, to repent, to find the things that need to be let go of, to find out who we really are. Maybe in our exile, we're having an opportunity to wrestle with God I hope that you're doing that. I hope that you're genuinely seeking to come face to face with God and wrestle with him, not just seeking easy answers, but trying to get to the bottom, praying and crying out, using things like the Psalms to help you find your way forward to get a hold of God and find the blessing that comes from being in that sort of intimate, sweat on sweat sort of relationship with your creator and your redeemer. And secondly, I hope that in the doing of this and in this exile, we will see ourselves for who we really are. Just as Jacob found out who he was looking into the mirror of his uncle Laban. And that you'll seek him with your whole heart and that we will find that he is the blessing that we've been looking for all along. That all the things, all the wealth, all the riches, all the things that have driven our discontentment will be shattered and that we'll find what we were looking for, the thing that we must hold on to if everything else has to be let go of in order to have him, we've got God because we don't want to confuse the source with the gift ever again. The question that I have for you and for me as we conclude is will you be among those who sleep through the night and awaken unchanged? Will you be among those who sleep through the night and awaken unchanged? Or will you wrestle with God for a blessing and emerge with a new identity? For in our Father's house, there is a place for everyone who seeks his face and who finds in him their true identity. If you're not a child of God, come, wrestle, Discover who he is in the face of his son, Jesus Christ. Be plunged into the waters and raised up a new creation with a new name, Christian. And if we can help you to do that, please reach out to us, contact us. We will help you and and, and we will get that done. We will help you in your wrestle with God. And if you're a Christian and you've gone into exile and you feel like you're in exile, then consider these things as to how you and I may find our way back home. Thank you.